everyone, and welcome to those who weren't here yesterday. Um, we're very pleased, again, on behalf of the University of Otago Religion Program and the Domakai Education Foundation to um, be able to support uh, the series of lectures from Dr. Trent Walker uh, on the topic of Buddhist poetry in Southeast Asia. Yesterday was our first talk, which was wonderful. Uh, we have recorded that talk for those who weren't here, and we are in the process of trying to establish a, a um, playlist from the university YouTube channel to post that, but it is recorded. And um, if you write to us individually, if you're you know, very anxious and you're keen to have a look at it before tomorrow, for example, um, you can email me and I'll, I, I can email you a link um, sooner than that. Um, I am also gonna give a very brief bio to Trent because it seems like every time I, I wanna give a longer bio, I, I feel constrained by time. But let me just say that, um, in addition to uh, Until Nirvana's Time, which we Trent generously provided us a copy of, which is right here, which has just come out uh, to much acclaim. Um, he's also recently edited a book, uh, a major anthology of Khmer literature, Out of the Shadows of Anchor, Cambodian Poetry, Prose, and Performance Through the Ages, which has just come out with the University of Hawaii Press as well. Um, or the, the, well, the, this is um, from Shambhala, but that's from the University of Hawaii. Um, two really important works, uh, in, you know, it, just in last year alone. So, um, and I know he's got a, a couple of really cool projects in the works as well right now. Um, again, maybe we'll uh, have time to talk more about that tomorrow, uh, but I don't want to take up our time today. So without further ado, let me return you to uh, Trent. So thank you again. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, thank you all here in the room for, for being here again. And uh, for those of you joining on Zoom, my respectful greetings and thanks to, to all of you for, for joining from, from far away, from wherever you may be. Some of you were here yesterday, some of you weren't. And I want to begin just with an opportunity for you to ask any questions you have that came up last time or things that you're wondering about Buddhist poetry in general, if you're new. So if we can just, again, begin like we did last time, but if you were here yesterday, just take a moment to think, were there any questions you had that you weren't um, able to ask yesterday you wanna, you're still curious about? Or if you're just joining us now and you weren't here for the lecture on language yesterday and you're showing up today for this talk dealing with connections between Buddhist poetry and prayer in Southeast Asia, then just something you're curious about that you might want to know more about or explore during this, this time we have together. And uh, you can put that in the chat if you're joining us remotely. Um, if you're here in the room, feel free to just think about it, write it down, and uh, share live as we did before. Thanks. So Dr. Eric White asks, is there any value in distinguishing between Buddhist poetry and Buddhist verse? This is a great question and one that I had not thought about. <laughs> I've been using these interchangeably, but uh, as we will look at this a little bit more today as well, there are a variety of verse forms that are considered verse within different Southeast Asian contexts that if viewed from another lens might count as something like rhymed prose or very lightly rhymed prose or poetically structured prose, things like that. So in other words, this question of how we divide between what counts as st strictly structured poetry in a certain sense uh, between other forms of writing that have um, aesthetic and poetical, poetic considerations. Welcome. Uh, in them is, I think, something that's important to consider. So that's, a, again, a wonderful question for us to return more to today. I think another way to ask that question is that sometimes poetry and verse can be used to describe different levels, as it were, in poetry. So for instance, take, for example, in Thai, this distinction between wanakadi and wanakam. Uh, both are one, one might translate as literature, um, but one would usually think of those in different 
echelons or have a different relationship to power. So things that get called wanakadi uh, would be specifically those that have been raised up and selected through this process that began over 100 years ago in Thailand to select uh, what was considered to be most representative of the best uh, literary creations uh, by Thai writers. And consequently, uh, those uh, pieces that end up being labeled wanakadi uh, end up being products of the court, uh, things that have been celebrated in elite circles, et cetera, whereas this term wanakam is much more broad to refer to all kinds of, of literary writing. Is that kind of distinction something that's present in this question between Buddhist poetry, which maybe has this somewhat more elevated term, we said, well, this is not just verse, this is poetry. Um, yeah, so anyways, that's a, that's a wonderful question and let's, let's keep uh, working through it. Other questions, those of you who are here in the room or those of you joining online, if, again, if you're online, feel free to type anything in you'd like. And if you're, you're here, um, anything you'd like to ask? I, I have some question, but it's not, it's not about poetry, but it's about what I read in your book. Please go ahead. It's like <laughs> I, I read about the con idea of paying debts. Mm -hmm. And I was yeah. mesmerized or intrigued about the common idea of paying debt to the earth, the, the elements around you. <laughs> yes, yes. So in terms of the overall structure of this week, uh, today I'm going to be talking around some doctrinal ideas connected to prayer. Tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about ideas related to debt and repayment of of debts. So I think maybe the best time to address tomorrow. that would be tomorrow. Are you able to join us tomorrow? Yes. Okay, and, fantastic. And, and I maybe I want to ask a question in, in advance. Like yes. in this modern age, we have technologies. And if I feel grateful to my Kindle, how can I pay them? <laughs> Do I feel grateful to my electronic devices? Yeah, exactly. Can I pay Ooh. that? Can I repay? <laughs> Let's let's look at the text tomorrow okay. and see where those technologies might fit in in the doctrinal systems that those texts articulate. Okay. Who knows? <laughs> Great question. Thank you. Wow. So, uh, Wing Wing Wang asks: Are there any particularities to the practice of prayer in Buddhism slash Buddhist poetry that are fundamentally distinct from other religious traditions? This is a hmm. question that I didn't think about, but it's one that we should address today. And I think I'll have to ask it back to all of you as we look through some of the ideas around uh, prayer. Um, some of these I think are distinct. Some of them we'd find quite abundant parallels with other religious traditions. So let's, let's see, and uh, we can discover together what might be some of those continuities and discontinuities. Let's, yeah. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. Um, you just the questions that came up yesterday for me today were about the uses, context, histories, the kind of politics, sociology behind the production of poetry. Yes. And so, uh, you know, for what the people who are, who, who are both sort of reproducing it, who are chanting it, who are producing it in the first instance, do they, do we have clues as to what they imagine themselves to be doing or the purpose that, you know, so, I mean, certainly uh, we can imagine other, the production of uh, texts in, in other types, genres of Buddhist texts as having a particular kind of purpose produced for a certain audience um, for certain kinds of reasons. This, it seemed like from what we talked about yesterday, much less sort of context around the production of, of, of poetry. And therefore um, there's a way in which it is sort of, already disembodied from a, a kind of a historical context, even when we first encounter it. Um, what then, how then should we think about that contextual element of Buddhist poetry? Perfect question. And I, I'm hoping again, that, that it's almost like you planted that question to be a, a segue for what we'll, we'll talk about. Um, because this question of poetry, the way I wanted to, and prayer, the way I wanted to frame it was through very specifically contextualizable pieces of verse. In other words, what we see in inscriptions, yeah. uh, as well as the kinds of prefaces and endings to poems where the authors specifically say why okay. they wrote yeah. such poems. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so we didn't have that in what we were looking at yesterday. We were kind of kind of trying to reconstruct that, but I, I thought it might be helpful to, to plunge into that today. And then I think that will also get to Gwyn's question as well as like, um, because part of my argument today is that there's something particular that's happening in Buddhist poetry in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. where prayer becomes not generalized, but autobiographical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what I, what I would like for us to focus on and explore. And we see that within these historically contextualizable sources. Yeah. So unless there are further questions uh, coming in online or here in the room, um, let me get started. So there was one uh, bit from yesterday that I, I, I didn't finish. And that uh, was, this is just for those of you who weren't here yesterday, we just put up these slides again. You could see some of the questions we were thinking about, you know, what is Buddhist poetry? Why are we trying to think through these terms, what are some of the aims of uh, this time we have together? And spent a little bit of time giving some geographic contextualization, et cetera. But the main thing I was talking about yesterday was the story of how one particular liturgical poem uh, initially in Pali gets transformed as it's translated and reimagined across different languages in Southeast Asia. So there was just the last part of it that I didn't get to. So one thing I wanted to quickly uh, loop back to from yesterday was uh, this term neye. Uh, this is an accusative plural, just it's grammatically, plural. just to clarify what was going on there. In other words, very literally, um, babodha, um, awaken in a, um, a imperative sense here. Okay. Um, neye those who are fit to be led, in other words, this particular category of living beings, madhye, um, in the mist, in the mist of what? Barisai, in the mist of the assembly. So that's just grammatically what was happening there. The last part that I didn't get to was we were looking at this uh, Khmer version by Sotanta Prachia An, and the particular choices that he made both in the Khmer version and the way that he filled out uh, this translation with the back translation into Pali of the portions that he added was that the closing part of the, the story and um, Elizabeth, I know this is a figure who shows up in your work as well, um, the monk uh, Ho Thao, who's uh, one of the two key founders of Theravada Buddhist traditions among um, uh, ethnic or ethnic Vietnamese speakers in southern Vietnam uh, during the end of the colonial period, beginning of the end independence period in mid, mid 20th century um, Southeast Asia. And he translated a having studied with leading Cambodian uh, monks of his day, particularly uh, some like Chuan Lat, uh, who would go on to become the uh, patriarch of the Cambodian Sangha. Uh, he translated a lot of material from Khmer and Pali. He had spent many years in Cambodia as a veterinarian and had gone to high school there growing up, um, and so was, was perfectly competent in both languages. And uh, I just wanted to bring your attention to some of the, the ways that he translates this text. They, these, this translation appears in a number of early publications uh, by um, uh, or uh, um, uh, such as this one, this is a, a close translation of uh, two related works attributed to um, uh, the circle around Juanat uh, and Huatat, again at this um, mid 20th century period. And the, when looking at the translation, we see that it follows almost exactly the same kinds of choices that we saw in Un's version. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's working not off the Pali, even though it's structured in the same way, this Ungsa worst followed by the, the, the drum simile, followed by the added portion by Un. Um, but the, the way that he does it uh, allows for this, uh, as I mentioned before, this kind of performative parody, P-A-R-I-T-Y, um, between these, these different traditions, such that something that had been a living uh, liturgical tradition in the Khmer context could be immediately imported um, into this Vietnamese uh, context. And the uh, particular poetic form that's used here is probably the most popular form for uh, poetry, both popular and, and Buddhist poetry uh, traditionally in, um, in Vietnam, or at least for 
several hundred years from which we have evidence for this form that's known as shang pak lu ba meaning two lines of seven syllables so we have seven syllables here and followed by a line of six followed by a line of eight um, with particular kinds of rhyme uh, patterns so for instance tiang muyang and duyang uh, rhyming uh, as well as particular kinds of tonal rules. So we'll look a little bit later at some Lao poetry that is structured not so much around rhyme, but around particular kinds of tonal rules. And these tone rules are very important in the context of Vietnamese poetry as well. Um, and something because of the way uh, Vietnamese is uh, written in this um, script, um, starting from the, at least on a wide scale from the um, end of the 19th or the 20th century, um, really allows us to see very clearly how those different kinds of rules are operating. So when we looked at, just to fill in the, some of the context, when we looked at these examples of Un's poetry, those of you who are familiar with Indic languages, just, uh, but you might, for instance, if you don't know Khmer, this is this, uh, transliteration here into um, Roman script that follows exactly the orthography of the text in Khmer. And when transliterated in this way, um, one might see many words uh, that look like they're Indic words. So for instance, Trilok here being Trilok, uh, uh, the three worlds, uh, Trilakna, the, the three marks, Samsara Chakra, the wheel of Samsara, et cetera, Avidja, ignorance. Um, even though these are not pronounced in this way in Khmer, so this avijja becomes avijja and bhajja becomes bhajai, um, et cetera. But we can still see the ways in which uh, Indic and local Southeast Asian words are very closely woven together. Um, and this has been a feature of writing in general, as well as the spoken language of uh, many languages in uh, mainland Southeast Asia uh, for at least the past 1500 years. We see a different pattern, when, of course, when we look at the case of this uh, translation into Vietnamese. And that is, there are many words here uh, that are like Vietnamese writing in general uh, that are coming uh, from uh, Chinese that are have a origin in literary Sinitic as well as later um, spoken uh, varieties of Chinese, all of which are part of the um, many ways that words have been uh, borrowed and incorporated and reformulated in Vietnamese over the centuries. Again, a process that has been unfolding over the past 2000 years. And so um, those of you who are uh, familiar with, uh, with Chinese might recognize uh, some of the, the particular words that are being used in this context. So something like um, what would be in Chinese, fan tian, for a Brahma deity becomes fan tian here in Vietnamese. Uh, for uh, other kinds of phrases, like for instance, uh, Chinese, di tou bing li, to bow, I guess literally to bow one's head, to lower uh, oneself, uh, richly becomes lei dou gan le, etc. Even though these are relatively rare phrases in, in in spoken Vietnamese, particularly the verbs uh, they and that don't commonly appear in, uh, in most dictionaries of Vietnamese, but they're here they're being drawn from this literary synetic vocabulary to very precisely, I think, in Ho Tong's um, intention here, uh, translate what's going on. We also see, just like in that phrase uh, of they do dan lei, this kind of use of reduplication. Reduplication is extremely important across um, Southeast Asian poetic traditions, particularly from the 18th century onward. Um, how this, why things began to change around then is something that I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, but we certainly see this pattern in Thai poetry, but by the 18th and particularly in the 19th century, say if one looks at the writing of Sun Tan Pu, who I mentioned yesterday, it's really rich with this kind of reduplication. Um, in other words, uh, just like this phrase we saw here, they know, that's, you know, essentially saying the same thing twice. Um, uh, we also see that right in the next line, they thai dou nhân, or this would be in, in Chinese. Um, uh, or they thai dou nhân. 
Um, and the essential meaning of Daitai and Nongyeng are both the same. I'm sort of literally saving the world, faring over or saving um, the world of humanity, the world of human beings. Um, but they're repeated partially for poetic effect, partially because it corresponds to a, a long uh, tradition, both in, in, in Chinese writing and Southeast writing, Southeast Asian writing of coming up with these kinds of paired, uh, often four syllable kinds of phrases. So again, this is something that we see uh, being uh, replicated uh, in this text. Then when we look at the particular ways, the very skillful ways, I think that Ho Tong uh, translated uh, So Tong Te on uh, verses in Khmer, just want to point out the ways he's able to capture some of the more subtle doctrinal details. So for instance, we looked before in the um, Khmer version, we're looking at this term uh, and Khmer, meaning the three marks of impermanence, suffering, and not self. And uh, here we have, excuse me, uh, we have that being spelled out in Vietnamese. Instead of saying the three uh, marks, um, it spells out what those, what, or at least one way of phrasing those in Sino-Vietnamese of Vô Thường Khổ Nào Tập Ta. And uh, again, pointing out that he's really trying to capture what's happening in the Khmer text, fit it into this Vietnamese form of poetry, um, but make it uh, accessible to an audience that was encountering Theravada Buddhism for the first time. A number of you asked yesterday about, so where, where does Mahayana Buddhism fit within this? I, I think at a later um, lecture this week, I'll bring in a little bit of Mahayana poetry as well from Southeast Asia. But even in this case of a translating Theravada ideas into Vietnamese poetry for the first time, we see this kind of resonance of a long history of Mahayana Buddhist terminology coming in through literary cinematic into Vietnamese. Um, another way we see that here's in the this final, uh, the four verses composed by Un, in other words, those new Pali verses that he composed, uh, we see uh, a couple of interesting choices that uh, being being made. So uh, I'm just going to take us back to the Pali to look at how he's approaching uh, this line here, uh, which here is translated as to say the group of Konanya who tasted the flavor of Nirvana without remainder. Mm -hmm. If we look back to the Pali there, um, that's uh, this this line here. Panchavagadiyo neye amatang paye siddhamato. As for those fit to be led, starting with the group of five, that is the Buddha's first five disciples that we see depicted in this Cambodian uh, or, um, uh, cloth painting. Um, he had them drink of the deathless, that is uh, nirvana naturally. But it doesn't you know, talk explicitly about who is in the group of five or what is the meaning of this term deathless, etc. And we would find the same is true if we looked at the um, Khmer. It simply says the group of five. Um, it's this uh, here, but not stating who belongs to it. Uh, when we look at the at Ho Tong's version, we see that he's able to clearly grasp what's going on and insert this kind of commentarial understanding of uh, how to best present to a Vietnamese audience that would have been familiar with these kinds of terms from a Mahayana Buddhist perspective, uh, what is uh, being implied here. So we have here, um, uh, we preach the Dharma to all disciples, starting with the five keen monks who read the Dharma. So that's this, again, this invocation. But then we get this clarifying part. Uh, that is to say the group of what in Pali would be known as Gaudanya. Uh, I think this particular uh, sign of Vietnamese transliteration is perhaps from another Indic language, for instance, this is Gaudanya in, in, in Sanskrit. And then instead of uh, framing Nirvana simply as the deathless, we get this very specific uh, technical term, Hu Yu Zikwang, or Yu Yu Nye Pan in Chinese, which is a, uh, the standard uh, literary Chinese translation for a self-bodization Nirvana, this kind of Nirvana without remainder. That is the experience of, uh, or the attainment of awakening that is reached within this life as opposed to at the moment of death. So, I just wanted to bring out those few last things from this text. So to kind of bring the, the story to a close um, as we journey with 
uh, this particular verse that started just with one stanza in Pali and the way that it expanded and clarified in these various ways as it um, traveled across uh, mainland Southeast Asia. So unless there are any questions at this time, as we wrap up this topic, I'm gonna go into the next one. Okay. Okay, so does he actually say he's translating Pratin? No. Um, and in the early translations, it doesn't say uh, that these are coming from Khmer sources. If one looks at the biographies, the Vietnamese language biographies of Ho Thong, it clarifies that, uh, yes, that these things were translated from, from Khmer, but it doesn't uh, indicate uh, the author in Khmer, for instance. Okay, so did you find that in Vietnam? Or was it in the archives? This, um, sorry, that was from, I think, either Cornell or Michigan. Okay. Um, it was something that I had to get over interlibrary loan from Berkeley, but yeah. It, yeah. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't know where to be able to find these kinds of older publications in Vietnam. I would find that to be very challenging, but that would be, uh, I think there's obviously a lot more. Um, yeah, Pascal, um, that's Pascal. Been written. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool, thanks. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to move on to this, the questions that we started with here around Buddhist poetry and prayer. So in invoking this term prayer, I'm thinking most explicitly of this, this Pali term Atidhana, um, which is related to this Sanskrit term Atishthana. Now, uh, this, this term has an interesting um, kind of history in a modern sense. So for instance, and this relates to Gwyn, your question as well, uh, that is, the this very term um, uh, Akidhana is one that's often used by Christians in Cambodia to translate prayer. So, for instance, uh, if one is say offering a short prayer before a meal uh, in a Christian context in Cambodia, I believe this is the term that's used. Right? I've heard people use that term in that context. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that term uh, was used, um, but- Testify. Testify, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it, 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 there's all kinds of ways to understand it. It's a term that within the Indic context, like so many terms uh, within Indic religious context can have a very wide uh, variety of meanings. So this term becomes, and, and it's Tibetan translation as well, becomes very important in the Vajrayana Buddhist context to refer to kinds of, um, blessings within the tantric uh, initiatory context. Um, the use of it in Theravada areas of mainland Southeast Asia is really around a kind of aspiration or vow, uh, but it's a somewhat more general term than that. I mean, literally it means like a, a, a laying down or an emplacement as it has this term sthana or uh, place uh, within it. Um, but within these Buddhist contexts, it's expanded to this broader sense of, of prayer, of aspirations, or in some cases, absolutions that might be made with a particular mental intention. The more specific term that we'd find for this sense of aspiration in a Buddhist context, we see this, at least some of these terms in South Asian contexts as well, are terms like vaniti, uh, vanidhana, pranidhana. And this is a Southeast Asian term that combines Sanskrit and, and Pali uh, words into a single compound, Satcha Pranithan or Satcha Pranithi in, in Khmer, for instance. And these terms have a more specific sense of a vow made to attain something in the future, an aspiration to attain something in the future. So they could be referred to an aspiration or a vow to attain uh, our hardship to be uh, awakened and achieve nirvana or to uh, achieve buddhahood. Uh, this is a kind of term that would be used in that context. And it's one that we would see often frames uh, in a genre sense what's happening in these forms of poetry. Another key term for thinking about how their, this relationship between poetry and prayer gets articulated in verse text is the idea of anisangsa. Um, this, this Pali term is usually translated as, as benefit, as, in other words, the kind of, um, can, can you say it one more time? Fruition. 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 Yeah, fruition. So the kinds of uh, 
beneficial karmic fruits uh, that result from particular wholesome actions. So anisangsa in a uh, homiletic context can refer to a variety of sermons um, that are structured as um, first stating what some particular meritorious act is, like listening to a sermon or copying the Tipitaka or offering a, a toilet. That's one of the most important and highly uh, revered kind of um, benefit actions within this, this traditional context. Uh, we're offering a whole monastery, for instance. The sermon then goes to detail all of the positive things that could result from that. So that's one sense of anisangsa here. We see this sense being worked out in, in poems as well. In other words, whatever the uh, particular act of merit, whether it's paying homage to the three jewels or writing a piece of Buddhist poetry, the author then articulates what, uh, what benefits they are wishing for. And are clearly articulating those benefits as part of the logic of prayer in this Buddhist context. Uh, a more specifically Cambodian understanding that we'll look at a little bit uh, later is this idea of Somnom and uh, Lama. So Somnom comes from the uh, Khmer uh, verbal root Som, meaning to, to wish for. And this, this, the broader sense here is one of aspiration. And then this is contrasted some, sometimes with Lama, which comes from this Khmer word Lia, meaning to uh, depart from to take leave of. And this is connected to acts of absolution, that is hoping or aspiring to be freed from the negative consequences of uh, unwholesome karma. We'll look at this a little bit uh, tomorrow as well, because some of the texts dealing with debt are really tied into ideas around absolution. What I want to highlight in the different pieces we're going through today, and I hope that can get us to both the, the questions that Eric and Quian raised for us, um, as, well as, as well as what you raised, um, Ben, around the kinds of historical uh, context for how particular authors wrote and structured these pieces, is this question around personal and generalized aspects of prayer. Now, of course, uh, Buddhists in mainland Southeast Asia are very frequently uh, reciting poems in a liturgical context. Um, these are often memorized, in some cases that they might be uh, working off a particular book or script, um, but often they're the, these memorized daily prayers of homage to the three jewels or asking for repentance or say in a Vietnamese context, uh, paying respect to Guang uh, Nayam or to Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, et cetera. Uh, all of this is part of the body or the repertoire of texts that uh, is living in a very real sense within people's bodies, within their memories, and is being intoned and resonated through their bodies on a daily basis. So much of that we might put in this category of a generalized aspect of prayer. In other words, those texts are not written to respond to any one particular person's uh, aspirations, but rather something that uh, everyone can participate in. But also, uh, when people go to uh, their own shrine at home, when they go to a Buddhist temple, when they go to um, any other kinds of uh, sites in a Buddhist context, when they're uh, making uh, merit through offerings or listening to the Dharma, et cetera, people are also engaged in personal acts of aspiration. They're deciding at that moment, well, what is it that I'm really hoping for? What am I aspiring for in my life? Who am I hoping to be freed from illness? Who, who has passed away in my life am I hoping to transfer merit to, et cetera. And so there's also this whole personal aspect that doesn't show up in the text that people most frequently memorize. For that, we have to look at texts that may have a specific authorship, uh, that again, prefaces to longer pieces of poetry. And again, we'll see in inscriptions that are often these very personal records of piety and prayers. We can get a sense of what's happening in this interrelationship between personal and generalized aspects of prayer and what role does do verse text or aesthetic text uh, written with poetic principles in mind, uh, how do those interact? And then sort of this key idea that I brought up before is, is there a way we can see 
Buddhist verse in Southeast Asia as sometimes articulating prayer as a kind of autobiography. So that's what I want to um, explore with you as we move forward. Any questions here? I'll just take a moment to pause. So you're using prayer to, as a, as a right, these are all a, a sort of approximations that you're using to, as, yes. as the uh, vernaculars for what we're taking prayer in the category of prayer. Yes. Right. Yes. I don't know if it's a good catch all word for the different things I'm yeah. trying to get at. Obviously, when the challenge, whenever of using words that have resonances in other religious traditions, we can somehow sometimes bring those resonances to what we're looking at in an, in another religious tradition. Yeah. Um, what sorts of th what sorts of other like local words would you would then fall outside of the category of prayer that some might people want might want to map? What what are the choices the, the, the difficult choices you had to make? Well, I don't think I made too many difficult choices. I was okay. looking for a very broad word and. Uh, in other words, so there's whole other kinds of things that I would categorize as prayer, like um, ideas like bonban in a Thai context of making a like a votive offering or uh, uh, having making a promise to a particular uh, deity or image of the Buddha that you know may I um, you know if I succeed in my exam or if I get well or if my relative gets well, or if I, uh, a child that I'm hoping to be born is born, then I promise to return and repay that debt to that particular deity or mm -hmm. that particular image or site, et cetera. So that's, I think, a whole other logic of prayer. We see that in inscriptions as well, um, that has different kind of vernacular terms that fits uh, within that. I guess I'm not, I think I, until you asked, I hadn't thought about what are the what are the limits then what mm -hmm. falls outside of this idea of prayer? Um, so uh, Huyen has a question here. I'm thinking of the word uh, in Chinese, sign of Vietnamese, with a connotation of pleading, beseeching in the word gao, which is very similar to the word song in, in Khmer. Those are often, even in kind of these translations between Khmer and Vietnamese, we often see that. And then uh, also this term, uh, wish, wishing or aspiration. Huyen. So um, absolutely, there's a dimension to uh, beseeching, supplicating, pleading in Khmer or Cambodian words for prayer. So that's absolutely there, Gwyn, in this term, som or somnom in the Khmer context. Um, we see, you know, if one looks at different kinds of prayer texts in uh, Thai, uh, we would see that words, this one that you pointed out for us, Eric, here, uh, karong, um, certainly the, the just the word ka is one that we see again and again and again. So to humbly ask for to request is something that will again appear again and again in these kinds of texts. Um, something that I find really interesting, and this you've brought up, Eric, in the different kinds of this sort of lexical field of what gets translated as prayer. So very often in Thai, words like suot or suot mon um, get translated as, uh, as prayer. I guess in that context, I. I usually um, think of that as chanting or recitation, and then the prayer could be part of what's being chanted, falls under that category of prayer, um, because it involves this idea of intentionally uh, asking for something or wishing for something. Um, but there are other aspects of Suat Mon that I wouldn't necessarily think of as falling under this broader category of, of prayer. But I, to me, that's always been a really interesting word. Same with this term Pawana or Pawana in Thai that um, you know, in some con consequences can mean meditation, in some con uh, contexts can mean this sense of internally um, cultivating, wishing, sorry, go for it. What, what did you say? Just oh, internally recite. Internally reciting, yes. Internally reciting. So internally reciting, even something like puto um, can fall, or re uh, reciting the entire um, list of the different uh, kun of the or the um, guna, the virtues of the qualities of the Buddha that can all uh, follow under this category of uh, pawana as well. Um, and then there are other terms that aren't so commonly used in a Buddhist context. So anwan, uh, for instance, doesn't so much appear in Buddhist, in very formal liturgical Buddhist texts. 
um, but would be something that appears in secular contexts very frequently. Um, same with Karong um, and et cetera, et cetera. So thank, thank you so much, Eric, and thank you so much, Gwen, for bringing up these, these, com these comparisons. So let's keep those in mind as we look at some of the specific texts and see whether it, it changes how we think about ideas around prayer. Did you have a- Yeah, I've got first some questions. So yeah. um, do you have any like um, definition for the pray, uh, pray and chanting? So like in terms of the length, like how long would it take? Like the prayer is much shorter or what, what about a chant? That's so interesting. Um, I guess I just thought about those in terms of until uh, you raised this question, I thought about them as different kinds of verbs and not, not having anything to do with time, but something like chanting referring to the physical act of a to intoning words aloud, yeah. particularly in a religious context. Yeah. And prayer is something that can happen out loud or silently, but involves specific intentional actions that are happening at a mental level as well. Uh, that could be in terms of offering homage, in terms of making a particular um, aspiration to achieve something or be freed from something. That's how I think, I, I thought of those in different spheres, but there's ways in which in different languages, those could, could come together. Um, so it's, it, I think it's interesting, for instance, in the Thai context, this term uh, kind of, that's a very common translation, very commonly translated as prayer. Whereas, um, uh, and uh, Gwen, you mentioned this term gongwen again, which is again very commonly translated as 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 prayer in a, in a Vietnamese context. But for instance, the term uh, to recite the scriptures, which is kind of the closest uh, approximation for suot mon in Thai, I don't think would usually be translated as prayer. It could be if one wanted to articulate for a non-Buddhist audience, like what it is that Buddhists are doing when they go to the temple. It, it's, a, it's a way to build that kind of uh, bridge for people that wanna understand what is it that they would be doing. But they're quite, I would think of those as quite different actions between Gong uh, Wen and Dong uh, to uh, make this kind of beseeching prayer and then also wish that's in, inherent within that Vietnamese uh, term um, as opposed to reciting uh, Buddhist scriptures. Mm -hmm. Can you probably look at what it actually means by pray in the context of like Christianity or in English? Yes. So I don't know. So, um, yes. So yes. Is, that, is that mean the same thing or? Um, <laughs> I mean, the volitional element, the, the, sorry, not the, the vote about the uh, imploring element. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's a very Protestant understanding of, of prayer mm -hmm. that's built into the term. But the but it's interesting, this conversation is actually, I've never actually thought about just how complex mm -hmm. this kind of mapping is, is. but but in, in the kinds of, you know, because of course the one that comes to mind for me is distinctive is, is puja karima, you know, that the act of offering, you know, does that, and on the one hand, does that necessarily imply something like an internal element or not? I don't think it does necessarily, but yeah, we're taking up a lot of your time with it. <laughs> no, this is great, this is great. This is why we're here. Yeah. So I'm gonna, we can, we'll continue to discuss these things as we look at some specific texts. And I think Ben will have a, a basis to explore. So some of the examples I wanna bring out first are some in, in epigraphic examples uh, from the Angorian period, from the, in, in largely once modern day Cambodia, also parts of modern day Thailand, the uh, Sukhot Hai period, this particular uh, kingdom and what's sort of uh, middle Northern Thailand today. The, uh, maybe I have one example from the Utia period and a few from Middle Cambodia as well. So just to get a sense of um, how far we're driving. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> that was the only way I could easily do that with, with my limited technological skills. But yes, it, it, that is also how long it would take to drive. But I think it would actually, you would spend a lot more time at the border and you need to rest for snacks and sleep, et cetera. So. so the where, the one where I want to begin is to think about a this early phase in Indic religions in mainland Southeast Asia. Um, and a number of the examples that I'll, I'll bring out here are specifically looking at the aspirations and um, 
ideas around what we might label as prayer, might not be uh, appropriately labeled as that, uh, made by uh, female authors or devotees. Um, this, the one will I begin is an example of this prashasti genre, prashasti being a very key genre of uh, quite ornate poetry, usually thought of within this genre of Gavya, this very um, um, ornate style of poetic writing in Sanskrit, in which um, there is usually a praise in the Cambodian context, a praise of various deities, either in a Brahmanical or in a Buddhist context, um, and then also uh, various um, uh, praises to the royal figures involved. So this is, you know, principally a genre of praise that's uh, glorifying royalty uh, and as well as uh, deities and was you know, foundational for the spread of Indic ideas across um, South and, and Southeast Asia, um, as well as for the, the spread of, of Sanskrit as a cosmopolitan language of power. This particular inscription is from the very end of the Angkorian period, probably from the late 12th or maybe eight, uh, early 13th centuries. This is just the very last uh, bit of this inscription, um, the last eight verses, I think, here. Um, the whole inscription is a little over than uh, 100 stanzas long. A lot of it is fragmentary, but the, the, again, the whole thing is quite long. Um, according to the last verse um, here, idam uh, prashastam vimlam vidhayasa, so she saw, um, Vidhaya having laid down idam prashastam vimlam, this uh, pure, this perfect, this stainless um, prashasta, this stainless prashasti style um, poem. Um, she vidyute, she she gleamed. She who was nirastar uh, sarvanya kala, whose whose skills eclipsed those of all others. Um, and this is referring to Indra Devi, the queen who is understood to be the author of this inscription. On the right there, that's an image that has, uh, is on the surface one of Pragna Paramita, an important Mahayana Buddhist uh, goddess, um, the, often framed as the mother of all Buddhas. Her name uh, literally means the, the perfection of wisdom. Um, but like many images from the Angkorian period, this is one that's been mapped onto particular figures. So this is probably also a portrait of either um, Indra Devi or her younger sister, Jairaj Devi. Um, in looking back through this last night, I realized I made some gross errors in the Sanskrit. So we won't look at it too closely. Um, <laughs> but um, the, and some, typos and et cetera. But uh, what I want to point out here is just uh, how a little bit of how this genre works. So it's a genre of kind of hyperbolic praise, um, but it also is one that can reveal to us what was held to be religiously important at particular periods in time. Um, and so here, uh, after this you know, long praise of her younger sister, who was originally the queen, and then she passes away, and Indra Devi rises to the queen, this is queen to King Jayavarman VII, one of the most uh, powerful monarchs in the Angkorian period, um, and who was uh, a promoter and builder of many Mahayana Buddhist temples. Um, this is this part of the text proclaims Indra Devi's uh, faith in and commitment to uh, Buddhism and also her great knowledge. Uh, for instance, this last uh, stanza here is one, one that's been thought about for a long time as, as to whether it gives evidence to there being Buddhist nuns in Cambodia during this period. Um, there's no specific word that means nun in this context, um, but it, it's very clearly showing how Indra Devi was teaching woman uh, Buddhist, um, presumably texts of some kind. So we have some sense of what's uh, what's happening, and these kinds of what's listed here as Buddhist abodes or presumably uh, monasteries. Then we have again in that the next stanza that follows a sense of you know how she's teaching in these different ways, and then uh, finally a uh, the penultimate stanza here. Uh, a sense of how uh, she's trying to frame herself and what her her life at the court was. What were the most important things that she was doing was 
um, sharing her knowledge, was teaching uh, others uh, within uh, the court. So this I just wanted to raise as an example of, it's very, very, in, in the Sanskrit, not in my translation, but in the, in the Sanskrit, it's very, very fine uh, Gavya style of poetry in Sanskrit, and one of the very few works that we can uh, securely attribute to a woman author during this period. Um, I want to now go to just a slightly later period to think about more specifically around these questions of prayer. So this is a, a pattern that we'll see very frequently in inscriptions and in poems that they begin with something that some, sometimes is described as a mangala, as a kind of uh, an auspicious verse at the beginning that usually takes the form of a some kind of homage. So the homage here in, in Pali, this is um, not the very first instance of Pali showing up in Cambodia, but it's uh, one of the first instances of a text composed in Cambodia uh, that's written in, in Pali um, and records the, the founding of a, a, a temple. And the opening uh, verse here, Visuddham Visuddhanam Suttisam Papakam Jinam Dhammam Jarya Sangancha Satatam Sirasaname, I bow my head down low eternally, Satatam, to the most pure victor, the Jinam, uh, um, who can bestow true purity even to the uh, impure. That's the sense of this Visuddham Visuddhanam Suttisam Papakam. Um, and as well as to the Dharma and the Noble Sangha. In other words, this is a praise to the three jewels. And it frames the, the, the whole text. Then we have what happens after a statement of the date. Um, and we were talking a little bit the other day around how these kinds of um, numerical systems work. So there's the ordinary way of stating numbers in Pali and Sanskrit, then one can also use these particular nouns. So for instance, moon is one, pair is two, moon is one, and blessing is eight. Um, and they're reversed in order in, a, in the Pali compound. So that's why we have mangala um, as for eight, indu for moon, yama for um, pair, and indu again uh, for uh, moon. Uh, but again, reflecting this, this date, uh, we have another date given uh, below, and then a statement of you know, what was taking place, what was the particular act that gave rise for this inscription as a legal document to come to light. But we see that it begins with this stanza of homage. So again, this is a pattern that we'll, we'll see when, what is the role of you know, whether this homage counts as prayer or how we might frame it, but it's, it's something that uh, patterns how these inscriptions work. Something else that we see in uh, inscriptions of this period are very specific kinds of uh, aspirations that are being articulated. So this is an, uh, a famous inscription from Wat Ba Mamuang in Sukkot High. And this, is, this inscription is paired with uh, one in Pali and one in Thai that communicate much the same content, but each of them are a little bit fragmentary. And it's this um, uh, aspiration, uh, which is here in the, in the middle paragraph here, that uh, this is just the end of, or just, it's actually a much longer inscription. This is just an excerpt of it. But um, this aspiration gives a sense of how in a literary prose, this is a very elegant use of old Khmer, one of the most um, literary sophisticated uh, pieces of writing in old Khmer. Um, but it is in prose. Um, but it gives us a sense of how different types of art, um, aspirations would be made uh, during this period. Um, so in Old Khmer, this would be something like Artisan Rohne, Halbun, the Aingu, Dosas, Prabut, Kamradang, and Rohne, and Buon Trishna, Jakarbotti, somewhat, Indra, somewhat, Prama, somewhat, and Trishna, Swum, Lang, and Ambanja, Prabut, the Nam Sat Hong Shlong, Tripop, Neku, Artisan Rohne. So we have a statement of what this aspiration is, no matter what merit I earn from the ordination. This is a, a the Thai uh, king, king, um, I think, um, or whatever he earns from the ordination, 
in the dispensation of the Buddha, in other words, he's ordaining uh, temporarily as a monk here. I crave not for the prizes of being born as a universal monarch, as Lord Intra, as Lord Brahma. I crave only to become a Buddha, so as to lead living beings across the three planes of existence. And of course, even though this sounds like a Mahayana kind of vow, it's very common for this period in Pali Buddhist context to have these kinds of vows for uh, to become a Buddha. And then we have also a statement of like, what is the consequence of, of this kind of vow? Um, another way in which we see these vows are good here is in a, from the almost the same period, a little bit later in Sukkot High history, um, relatively nearby, this is at uh, Wat Asogara um, in Sukkot High. Um, and this inscription this is a portion in Thai, this is a portion in Pali, this is the portion in Pali. It's, uh, written in this very clear style, simple style of Pali verse. And here it's attributed to the, to the queen. Um, and here she's articulating what exactly she's aspiring for. This is again, a pattern we'll see in inscriptions and in poetic writing throughout the centuries since, uh, again, it's the end of the 14th century up to the present. So she states, you know, by means of this meritorious action with this stereotype phrase, imina punya kamena, and then, stating all the people who she wants to be uh, the recipient of this merit, so members of her family, uh, as well as um, all others, nyati um, anyatika, uh, relatives and non-relatives, so they may all be happy. Um, and then uh, she gives another uh, sense of how the benefits should be, how she hopes that they would be made manifest in the world, in this case, by the power of my merit, power in the sense of anubhava here, uh, the kinds of um, spiritually effective power um, that is attributed to merit or punya in this context, so that they might enjoy a more fortunate rebirth. And then uh, we see the specific, more, somewhat more autobiographical dimensions of what she's aspiring to. Um, so she says, by the power of my merit, may I be a man in the future, may I listen to the lofty teachings of my Thea Buddha, that is the future Buddha to come. And then in that context, uh, may she be a distinguished disciple of the Buddha. In other words, in the midst of that assembly, may the Buddha praise me. May none be equally equal to me across all existences and the virtues led by generosity, beauty, fame, longevity, and wealth. And though it doesn't say so explicitly, uh, these kinds of aspirations are again often tied to the idea of aspiring to become a Buddha in the future. Um, sometimes we see relatively more uh, simple aspirations or ones that are articulated Simple is the wrong word. Uh, an aspiration that's articulated in more simple language. It might be just as uh, deep and complex an aspiration. But here's a, this is sort of one example. There are not many examples of this, these kinds of aspirations that survive in um, uh, epigraphy from the Ayutthaya period. Um, this is one that's attributed to a lay woman named Akel Saidam. Uh, and here on the line 13, with regards to whatever merit I have performed, um, uh, in other words, um, whatever merit I've performed, I respire to become a mother of the Lord in the hereafter, who shall arrive in the distant future in this world. In other words, she hopes to become the, the mother of Maitreya or some other future uh, Buddha, et cetera. So again, this is articulated in prose, but gives us a sense of how these aspirations might work. Another one, this is uh, bringing us to back to, not back, this is, we'll look at another piece from Angkor Wat later, but this is in the middle period of Cambodia, long after Angkor Wat was constructed in the 12th century, uh, as initially as a Vaishnava temple, it became an important site of Buddhist pilgrimage during this middle period in Cambodian history. Here's one of the very earliest inscriptions attributed to a uh, queen of Cambodia at that time, actually the mother of the king, I think, at that time uh, uh, in 1577. Uh, and uh, this inscription gives in this very literary style of prose, um, not a formal form of verse, but a very literary, literary style of prose uh, articulates what her, uh, her aspirations are. And it begins with a statement of faith, of uh, shraddha. And uh, 
them these kind of very elaborate statements on, you know, what is the, who is the Buddha here? The Buddha is being depicted of our Lord, the chief refuge comparable to a huge towering junk. It's a big ship capable of ferrying living beings across the ocean. That is to say this realm of rebirth, a wasteland. And then she gives this account of uh, what's specifically happening. So it begins with this opening prayer. And then we have, we plunge into the moment of the present, a statement of the date, just like we've seen in these prior examples. Um, and here she's seeing how her son, Kinantan, uh, restored uh, Angkor Wat. And uh, then she says, I too uh, am endowed with virtuous faith. So not just her son, but she too uh, did all of these uh, important meritorious actions. Begins with this contemplation of impermanence. Um, and this will meet on Thursday uh, to not tomorrow's lecture, but the day after, uh, we'll look at some of the, the ways in which contemplations of impermanence or the shock that comes out in the contemplation of impermanence shows up in Buddhist poetry, but just to show that that's happening here as well. And then her particular act of merit is burning her top knot into ash. In other words, taking some of her hair and making it into lacquer uh, to construct a Buddha image at that time. And then she gives a sense of what she hopes to do. It's not just what she hopes to receive in the future, but a vow that she's making. And here she says, I, I made the truthful vow. Um, and this term here is satya vidhan. Um, uh, that is satya adhidhana. Um, uh, to become upasakarwat, that is a jewel of a lay person, that is a highly distinguished lay person, upholding the five precepts with diligent effort and upholding the eight precepts on every half full and new moon continuously until the ultimate demise of this life. And then we get what her very um, personal aspirations are for the future. She has, she'll state what she vows to do, and then this is also tied to what she uh, hopes. And uh, in that vow section, we saw this term satya akidhana used. In this section here, we have a version of anisang. So here it's phrased as uh, palani song in Khmer, or um, palani song in Thai. So this the karmic benefits, the, the fruits uh, that she's hoping to attain. And like that other previous queen, she hopes to be reborn as a man, but not just not an ordinary man, one endowed with all kinds of uh, marks of wealth and merit. And then again, very specifically hoping to be reborn uh, at the time of Maitreya to ordain as a monk. And just as she had offered her hair in this present life, she hopes to then shave it off and ordain as a monk in that future life. And not again, not to be an ordinary one, but one who perfects these 13 ascetic practices and the 40 subjects of meditation, etc. Um, so again, I'm trying to bring out a sense of which there's aspects of prayer in these historically contextual texts that are quite uh, generalized, that we see patterns across all of them, but there's also aspects that are very personal. And in each case, the autobiography, the story of the individual person writing is tied into it. And so I'm trying to understand what's going on in that interaction between prayer and autobiography. Mm -hmm. This is just to bring some examples from a bit later. This is, these are now, um, one, the one on the left is probably late 18th century, um, uh, the Khmer version. So sorry, this here is the, is the Pali text from the opening stanzas to Budokos's Samantha Basarika, this commentary on the Vinaya. Um, and this is another example of how this is a kind of generalized prayer that would be recited in Cambodia um, very frequently. Um, uh, a text that many have memorized. Uh, that has a particular set rhythm that's baked into the metrical structure of this poem. And then the translation into Khmer, um, just like we had that rhythm in Pali, in the Khmer pronunciation of the Pali, we get in the Khmer translation of this same very frequently memorized liturgical text. I don't have it up here, but it goes something like, 
etc. So that it keeps this exact uh, rhythmic structure like we saw um, yesterday. And then just to give you a sense of how that works in English, the Lord, the final refuge of all beings, vowed to earn merit or the span of ages, myriads of eons beyond counter concept to reach omniscience as our only teacher, etc. Um, and this is an example of a very generalized kind of prayer um, that, again, is recited up to the present. Sometimes we see reformulations of that that appear in literary context. So this uh, on the right is actually the beginning to Moranat Mietba. Moranat Mietba, this is a, um, I think the first uh, photocopy of the first Khmer uh, printing of this. This text itself was composed in 1882 um, and uh, is a, Khmer reworking of the Thai uh, Bla Buthong narrative, the Golden Gobi uh, narrative, as articulated within this Buddhist treatise known as the Jaitana Beheda that I've worked on in, a, in another context. But here at the beginning of this literary text, which is ultimately, at least one, one gets into the very um, exciting story of a, of, that's uh, related to an East Asian um, version of Cinderella. Um, the, the very beginning is very much framed in a, a Buddhist context with this kind of prayer. Something that's interesting here is that this is in Pali. So here we're looking on the right side of the screen, but the Pali is not um, functioning according to the normal rules of Pali grammar. It's Pali that's been uh, made explicitly to fit into this particular form of Khmer verse. So this form of Khmer verse is known as Gakatai or Gakakati, the crow's gate uh, verse. Uh, this is known as Ga Surankanang Isupai in, in Thai. Um, and uh, this, this kind of verse is very common in literary texts from the 16th to the 19th centuries and has a kind of you know rhyme scheme that uh, as we would expect for other forms of Cambodian poetry at the period. But it's usually written in Khmer. It's not usually written in Pali. But here we have this way in which it's been, the Pali has been adapted. Um, and we get the same kind of rhymes as the, we would expect in the Khmer. So, Namami Hung rhymes with Apiwangdang, or Susambudho rhymes with Varnyano and Nyanutamo, just like it would be in the, in the Khmer. Um, and then we also have this very precise syllabic structure in the, this particular meter. We have seven lines, each of which has four syllables. Um, and that, you know, again, creates a particular kind of uh, metrical effect. Um, or it could be reset in a more Khmer style. Uh, such that the, the metrical structure can be continued. The grammar, however, doesn't make much sense. If one looks at this uh, from just the perspective of Pali writing, the grammar is, doesn't really hold together. But if one translates the words literally into Khmer and then imagines that this is being written from that perspective, then it makes perfect sense. Often we see at the beginning of Buddhist poems are, uh, again, these kinds of opening uh, verses of praise. Sometimes they even uh, connect to the very act of writing or reciting. So ordinarily in the context of offering homage in a Buddhist context, one might offer candles or incense or lamps or lotus flowers or drums and gongs or music or Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. All of these might be offered as acts of puja or worship in a Buddhist context. But what about in the case of a poem? When you're only reciting a poem and you're not able to get up and offer these other things, or one is writing a poem, how is the act of worship? How is this kind of prayer refigured into the poem itself? So these are. This is an example of a uh, a poem that was originally written in Thai. In this. It made it the same kind of meter we've been talking about. And then probably in the early 19th century was translated into Khmer. And there, it's a very close translation, again, because of the ways in which uh, these 
meters are very similar in the two languages. Um, but the, the overall content of this text, you can uh, guess from the first line of the tie there, that's about, it's, it's a praise to the lilac, to the symbols on the, um, the soles of the Buddha's feet. Um, and it's an explanation of what all those symbols are and also the benefits, the adhisangs of paying respect to those symbols. Um, but what we see uh, in these opening lines is the way in which the recitation of the poem itself and this act of joining one's palms and reciting them and using uh, lovely words. So for instance, uh, when it says here uh, in Thai, with my two, my, my 10 fingers as a blossom. In other words, taking the fingers together so that they form this lotus-like blossom in place of incense and gold candles. So it, the very act of reciting the poem takes place, uh, uh, stands in for ordinary acts of worship. The two eyes, the eyes that may be uh, present or reading the poem at, uh, in, in place of offered lamps, the hair on the head for uh, lordly lotuses, uh, lovely words here framed as wat, uh, wat da prong um, in place of gongs and drums. The ordinary kind of sonic offerings here are being framed as uh, what's uh, being offered in the recitation. And then of course, what's happening internally, the kind of internal dimensions to prayer um, here in Thai framed as duong jai ka mai, so my, uh, the sphere of my heart uh, or the my mental spheres that the intention of that is being offered in place of fragrant taste or in Khmer, Dung Jat Kanyom Thwai, Tang Ruh Kun Thia, my mental sphere offered in place of fragrant taste. So this is somewhat of a bridge between prayer that's generalized and something that's made specific to the context of reading and writing poetry. We see this even more explicitly in this poem of Bikusawanda Kesar or Bikusawanda Kesar. Um, he was apparently a monk who resided at Wat Chuk Sa. This is a temple near the capital of Long uh, during the 18th and 19th centuries in Cambodia. And the, the poet, this poem presumably re, um, uh, dates from that period as well. And this one is interesting linguistically in the sense that it combines portions in Pali and uh, Khmer. So we see here again in the same meter that we built here, the same crow's gate meter, Sirasang Me Badumang Kate. And then continues in Khmer, Sirsa Nang Kai, Yong Bu Chia Chu, Ka Chuk Tang Lai, Mai Khang Yong Mo Mai, Le Plao Ta Phong. Having made my head into a lotus, my head and body offered in place of lotus flowers, my hands I offer them respectfully raised up high. So the same concept is being uh, articulated here, and then is linked to his biography, Bikusa Wanda Kesara, the magnificent who resides in Wat Chuk Sa the White Lotus Temple, by resorting, resorting to the pattern of the commentaries expressed and recorded this. This is this idea that composition uh, has to conform with the standards of Buddhist exegesis is something that we see again and again. It's very, it's actually very rare for authors of these kinds of Buddhist poems to state that they are the author. In most other cases, either those parts of the poems have been lost and not transmitted over time because they're not generalizable and not as accessible to others who might use or memorize the poems. Uh, in some cases, um, because the, the authors are not sort of emphasizing themselves, but rather they're uh, creating this as something that others can use as well. But when authors do mention their names or state why they might be uh, composing something, it's not usually from the framework of I'm composing this out of my own uh, creativity, but rather I'm basing it on something that already had existed. I'm writing in a way that conforms to a precise exegetical explanation. So this idea of rumpung rachana tampre atakatha, that is very literally resorting or having relied on the rachana, the, uh, the pattern, uh, the way that texts are laid out, um, in accordance with the holy this layer of the commentaries. That is the way in which he's framing the writing of this poem. So we see something similar when we look into some of the works of Lao literature, for, for instance. So this work, Sang Sin, uh, Sang Sin Sai, um, is perhaps the most, uh, by, the, by the 20th century, the most famous um, poem in, in Lao and sort of held up 
by 20th century standards as uh, probably the most important work of, of Lao literature. This, the picture on the right, this is from a modern reprinting of the edition by uh, Maha Sila Wilwong, uh, who was the probably, again, most important uh, Lao intellectual of the 20th century. He was actually born in Isan and educated in Bangkok, um, but uh, dedicated you know, most of his life to this cause of Lao uh, literature. Um, and uh, again, mostly writing in Lao in that context. And uh, his version of the text includes a lot of passages that he's inserted because he wanted to have it um, conform to this, these particular ideas that he had about how Lao poetry should look. But if we look at the very beginning, there aren't any inserted passages. And this, this, this agrees with the manuscripts uh, of the text that, that survive. And there are many manuscripts of the Sang, uh, Sang Xin Sai uh, narrative. This narrative is one that, uh, well, this is probably the most famous and important uh, version of this and most celebrated version of this in Southeast Asia. Um, and this may have been the first vernacular version. We don't know about that. Um, there are also versions of this narrative in Cambodia, where it's known as Sang Sabak Jai, uh, or in Thailand um, as Sang Sang Sin Chai, and Bang uh, Kham. Uh, the the author here is uh, very very skilled in how he used this verse form in in Lao. This particular verse form is usually known as Gon An in, in Lao, um, which is one, um, one of various forms that are used for writing in the, this, this period, probably 16th to the 17th century. Um, it is not one that has external rhyme. So again, I was talking that most forms of poetry in mainland Southeast Asia are structured around ideas of external rhyme. That is the, the ends of lines or the sometimes particular syllables in the lines rhymes with other ends or other particular syllables and lines that follow, um, or there are linking rhymes that tie the different syllables together. The Sang Sin Sai does not have those kinds of uh, rhymes. So it's a very different effect. Let me just play for you um, well, I'll, I'll read this part aloud and we'll look at the translation, but then I'll play you a recitation of it by one of the leading uh, poetry and um, other sort of ritual recitation masters of Laos. So you get a sense of how it might be recited. Um, so this is the opening part, which if, again, we would expect this kind of uh, mangala, this kind of opening verse of homage to appear before we get, we plunge into the specifics of the author. So we'll look at that in a sec. Um, but this part begins, see, so pamang kala le lam, city de lusa, not whole, suit not yan, by gal. So what city nom, I ham put a bar, hun yon, uh, nooks like gal, sully, sully yam, not yan. Um, very somewhat more literally, this is glory, may blessings overflow from the sheer might and rare renown of Lord Buddha, our protector, the foremost mind of the three jewels. Success, I bow to his teachings, the Dharma of our sage, the king, lifting all virtues to my head in honor of wisdom's true peak. And then below that, I've, um, I, I wasn't happy with my initial translation because it felt too wordy. So I tried to give a one that fit into a, I think a 10 syllable structure in English. So that's what we have going forward. But um, that 10 syllable structure is a compromise when loses out on some of the words that are, that are in the Lao. Um, so let's just hear the recitation of that um, as it would actually be recited in a, uh, in a, in a context in Laos today. Um, so this is, um, uh, Ajahn Maha Bun Tum Si Bun Hung, who's again one of the most famous uh, uh, poetry reciters, and also um, Morham uh, and Morhan in, in a Lao context. Tham Tung Ma Hin Hung Yan Yot Kiao, Tang Tin Sai Ko Cha Pui Tiang Fang Do Ti Bo Dai An. No, Ani Tao Pai Ko Suen Tan Tang Lai Ha Fang. Ban Ti Nung Som Mut Ti Ban Pu Eun Wa Ban. สมมุติบัตรนี่คือการนอมไว้สิ้นสุภมังคันลานเดิน
สามวัดสันดีนอมในธรรมพุทธธรรมบาทคุณยอมยกใส่เก่าสุรีลำยอดยานควบเมื่อหวนหวนฟังห้องหำลานดูฝนผุนเยอวายุผ่าเลี้ยงลวงควายคุ้มดา So after this opening uh, verse of homage, uh, we then get the very specific context. Instead of a date of when he composed it, we have a sense of what what the weather was like. This is something that we find also occurring in later works of Lao literature. It's a very distinctive, um, I think, approach to beginning a, a text like this. The sky rumbled. The rainy season sigh, um, sign. Uh, when winds and storms assail the earth, pink orchid boughs set free their flowers, a surfeit of seeds scattered, forceful. Above, a mass of clouds loomed large, covering the sun just as it slipped behind a stand of trees. The moon rose through the third month stars in the year of the lovely ox, the most charmed time. It was then that I, Bang Ham, uh, pondered the dharma, thinking how the chief sage cycled through samsara. I wished to compose, to translate these texts into Thai. Uh, so appealed to the heavens for inspiration when weary. I bowed to the four guardians, the Lord of all lands, to the great Garudas, Nagas, gods, and goddesses. And then in the part that I don't have the translation up here now, um, he he continues to go through um, why he's you know asking for the support of these four guardians and all these deities. It's in order to compose uh, this poem. And why why compose it? Uh, why that? That dong bun when yang yam ken. In order to compose it such that it can be uh, a mirror or something to to contemplate uh, to contemplate um, in times of of worry or times of difficulty. ตามที่อังสลีเท่าทวารสามนมนอบมันมันนี้ in in accordance with the way I have. Paid, I have paid homage through my joined palms, through the three doors, that is through body, speech, and mind, um, offering to the three uh, jewels at all time. Now I uh, shall compose, taking the jatakas, this is this term, kai sa pe tham kon lao. So unfolding or extracting the meaning from this jataka text and Translating the Dharma by um, Ham, such that it can be something that people in the world can uh, enjoy. And then in the last line of verse seven here, he's saying that this is really in the the Hasip um, Sat, uh, that is the Panyasa uh, Jataka, this um, non canonical or post canonical collection of Jataka tales composed in Southeast Asia. And then eight is the beginning of the story itself. Just giving you a landscape of how the elements of prayer and the biography of the, or the autobiograph autobiographical details of the author get woven together in the beginnings of of these kinds of texts, from inscriptions to uh, literary texts, primarily used for recitation. Let me pause here. There's. I have I have more materials to go through, um, but I I really want to make time for a discussion. So let's um, and I will also have a sip of water. <laughs> My money cap. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I hope those of you who are on Zoom are regularly getting up, walking around, or <laughs> doing all the things you need to do. Yeah. Mm. But if you have any questions, I think it's even possible for you to unmute yourself and ask. That works as well as the chat. And Elizabeth, so, you have a question, is please. Is Hong Kong the same as Mahasilawang? No, sorry. So um, Bang Ham lived during this period, 16th to 17th century. And then the, okay, so the we'll scholar I mentioned from Isan, um, Mahasilawang, he uh, it's a 20th century figure. OK, I see. I actually wrote that down. I was just forgot it. Yeah, sorry. Eric's got a question there. Oh yeah, please. Do we have any historical evidence regarding the ritual practice that accompanied the performance of Buddhist poetry as prayer in earlier centuries? Were there any distinctive behavioral practices stereotypically associated with praying that distinguish it from other wholesome ritual acts of a meritorious nature? 
Well, these are great questions. Uh, do we have any sense of how the aesthetics of the oral speech were coordinated with the aesthetics of physical activity to create a total ritual performance? So let's, but let's work backwards here. So I think in some of the examples we were just looking at, I think there is certain clues we can uh, determine from these texts around a sense of the aesthetics of oral speech. In this case, we can assume that it was recitation often with uh, particular musical elements, whether melodies or more simple kinds of chant, um, that were coordinated with the aesthetics of physical activity. And the key aesthetics that we see showing up again and again in these texts uh, when elements of prayer are mentioned is what the body should be doing. So certainly, um, certainly the, as uh, Elizabeth, you're demonstrating the ways in which um, the hands are being offered or placed up high, um, the way the body might be uh, seated in a particular way or the head being inclined at particular moments. These are absolutely part of what Eric, you call a total ritual performance. And I think there's lots of evidence in the texts, both in inscriptions and in literary texts that this is the kind of context. Something we, we could talk about later is the ways in which inscriptions, for instance, mention aspects of chanting and recitation, or even um, borrow or cite these kinds of chanted and recited texts as if um, in invoking this, this living ritual practice of the period. And that allows us to make these kinds of historical connections between what's happening in the present and what's happening in the past. Um, so I think Yes, uh, those give us a sense of the kinds of distinct behavioral practices. Uh, melodic recitation, um, uh, disciplining the body in a particular way to be uh, respectful and for maximum efficaciousness in the context of performing um, these uh, meritorious actions. Um, but I think there's probably a lot more that we're missing. And there's a lot there that sort of isn't going to be present in the historical record. We'll look at one text tomorrow that's always fascinated me in this regard that describes a number of things that people do that they're not supposed to do when listening to Buddhist chanting or listening to sermons or when going to the temples. In a way, that's a kind of anti or sort of an ebbs, it's not uh, anti evidence, um, but it's a it's kind of the way, like, for instance, in the Vinaya, we have all this evidence of monastics behaving badly, which shows us that those were real concerns. These are real things that were happening, presumably, in, in the Sangha. Um, so in the same way, texts that describe things that people might have not supposed to have done in the context of listening or the performance of these kinds of poetic texts or in sermons, et cetera, we can get a sense of that. So I think let's ask this question again um, tomorrow as well. John has a question. Please. Well, I thought I'd, um, I, well, first of all, all this is just totally brilliant, uh, Trent, and it's just amazing how you can bring all these things together in the way you do. And, um, but just to play a little bit of the devil's advocate, I mean, uh, um, that the question would be is by using the word prayer, to what extent that tends to project ideas that that maybe are not there in the original context i mean what we see is is obeisance we see the um the body language that nowadays we associate with prayer uh, mm -hmm. and we see people making vows and i think you've been very careful in your wording and not often you say, well, these are aspects of, of prayer. And so mm -hmm. just to keep that in mind, I mean, you started out talking about different terminologies for prayer. And, and I wonder how much these concepts as reflected these terminologies are, are, um, are, are really there as a single concept of prayer. Um, uh, since I'm at home, I could take off my Marcel Mose from my my shelf. And incidentally, Marcel Mose's book on 
prayer. I mean, it was it was never completed in his lifetime, and you probably know it much better than me. It has a oh, no, chapter. Uh, it has a chapter. It, as a matter of fact, it has a chapter called um, "Do Prayers Exist in Australia?" And so the question, "Do prayers exist in New Zealand?" is another question. But um, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, you know, and most is really wonderful and uh i i i'm tempted to just read some things from there but of course being most he he does talk about individual um uh uh well every prayer is an act Indivi the individuality of prayer at the same time of course he has a heavy emphasis on on ritual coming from the tradition he had as uh, the communal aspects of it and you are emphasizing um, this autobiographical aspects, which is really quite striking that you could find it. And that makes it seem more like prayer in our concept. At the same time, uh, then uh, a lot of what we're seeing is, is, is communal ritual, which is, um, which is sometimes but most would say that is part of, of prayer always. Um, but it's also something different than um, uh, uh, than what we sometimes think of prayer in in the more modern Christian sense. Okay, those are my comments. So that's fabulous. Thank thank you so much. I I, I have not read that by mouth, so I, I I look forward to checking that that out. That looks that looks very relevant for this question. You can actually build on John's point because I think that's a really helpful. Actually, both you and Eric's points are really really helpful, and I think that that sort of it sort of put your fit your, fit, your fingers on something that's I think I'm a little bit unclear to me on the on the examples we got, which is to say that um, you know a lot when I, in the in the kind of manuscript traditions that I'm familiar with. I do see things not unlike this, these kinds of elements of, um, you know, that I'm offering such and such a text as a prayer and, you know, the, the um, um, you know, punya kamena sort of formation, right? Uh, but through, in which the, in which the punya is the act of producing the manuscript or whatever it is and, and as, and then some various kinds of analogies to um, the act of manuscript uh, uh, preservation or manuscript copying as um, is analogous to, to offering to puja basically is, is the imagery really. Um, but I guess my question is then is the prayer, I mean, in a way, I see that act and, and the sort of individual, again, punya kamena, the, 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 the through my, the, my, through my punya action as the, as an act of prayer in the sense that they're obviously doing it for their own karmic betterment the people who's writing the prayer who's in, in my case you know writing the manuscript or whatever but it's not clear to me that these would then be used as kind of liturgical text by other people that the prayer in other words is a kind of a it's it's the prayer of the it's the prayer involved in the action itself but it's unclear to me and i guess i wanted to ask you how these texts are then used by others in the context of prayer, or if indeed they are or where is the moment of prayer as, as it were the, i think you know uh, apropos of John's comment, like, because I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but you would might be happier with the kind of approximation of the language of prayer if what Trent is referring to is the prayer involved in the, in the personal act of the creation of the, of the verses, as opposed to thinking about these things used in other uh, more more communal settings, right? as as sort of chants or whatever. It, 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 so there's this kind of interesting sort of spectrum as to which into which the <laughs> the the uh, the verse can fall, right? At the, at the in time one, in the act of, of of preparation, it is something kind of you know you could think of it as something like prayer. If we are to believe the it, to take the words at face value, which I'm not sure we want to necessarily, because just like Prashasti. These things are very formulaic, right? So, in in in, in other words, the, the the very kind of rhetoric that I want to say is prayer like, um, which talks about the, the 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 goals and the intentions, the inner world of the of the author, um, are also following certain kind of literary conventions that may not approximate the inner world of the you know that it may mean that the inner world of the author is irrelevant completely. But if if we were to say, accept it at, at at that time one, there is a prayer like quality to this. At time two, whenever we see these things out in the world after they've been composed. Do, 
is that also a kind of a prayer like moment for you i guess is, is, is where i was leading with this long question i think i think what you've raised brings up for me how can we distinguish those moments if on the one hand there's this way in which what we think of as an internal process or an autobiographical process mm. is following certain uh, formulas mm. and even those autobiographically written things get used by others mm. as a way to articulate mm. something that feels important to them. Mm, mm, mm. So I'm a bit caught in this loop, yeah. uh, mm. as it were, not able to distinguish easily what's uh, what we might uh, attribute to a single person, mm. what might uh, fall in something else, and then how this, this term, which I've realized I'm <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, a nice, wonderful can of worms, but yeah, yeah. it's uh, is a uh, yeah. There, there's so many problems uh, in a sense with using this mm. this 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 term prayer. Um, so maybe if I bring up one more example yeah. that we can think through, just we'll take the what what each of you have raised, uh, Eric, um, Ben, and uh, John, and and see how it makes sense in, in this other context. So here I'm going to switch to um, and, and by the way, if anyone else wants to write questions or comments in, well, we have the, the chat open, so you can think of it as kind of you can feel free to do that. So here's one example that I, I would bring up. And this is again an inscription from Angkor Wat. It's a little bit later than the one we just looked at, a little more than a century later from 1684. And here are the, the author, this um, high ranking official named Sapnaik um, Preh Paravutu, um, goes through this very, I think, hyperbolic account of his own life and all the things that he's offered. And then we have a sense of his of asp aspiration. So I, if we can just look at this a little bit together, I'm going to skip sort of, for, it's kind of, it's a little long, so we can't look at every detail, but just to highlight how it parallels things we've seen so far. Um, so it begins with this um, uh, asking the, the Buddha, in a sense, to be witness to this account of merit. And it begins with this uh, describing what his faith is like with these very, um, this is in this style of writing Khmer known as Kamrong Kaya, which is somewhere between verse and prose. It's prose that's linked with these kinds of rhymes, somewhat less structured than Rai in a Thai context, but um, again, a, a way in which that's falling between these two categories. Uh, so things like uh, my fervent aspiration, grounded in truthful resolve of meritorious words is vast, peerless, exceptional, the fruit of the unified mind. It beams, radiant with joy, a jewel among bloodborne blossoms, subtle yet blissful beyond thought. It charms and dazzles, adorned by the delight of fragrant sense and taste. Soaring to lofty heights, it shines as bright as the best of lotuses, supreme in its abundance. It arrives right at the auspicious hour in all places equally, completely unprompted. <laughs> and here this is um, a formula. We see something very, very similar to this in many other inscriptions from the period, but it's presented as if it's something um, of his own. Then we have this praise of the Buddha, similar to what we saw before. Then uh, we have his reflections on being stirred by impermanence. Um, and on that account, that's the framework again, same thing we saw before. So it's falling within this formulaic pattern of stating the date and what he did from the time he was 16 to 57, we get a list. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting this to stay in one place. Um, but the list includes all these Buddha images that he offered, um, hundreds of them, uh, the Bodhi trees that he planted, um, the sand stupa, the gifts of monastic robes, the, he financed the digging of wells, the shaping of ponds, the clearing of roads, building of bridges on five more occasions and offered fire, water, cloth, fine meals, uh, mat seats, cookware, water vessels, and beetle boxes to the monastic community, and then cut it off with flags, ceiling drapes, and sponsored manuscripts, etc. So we have this whole listing of the things that he did. It's this, again, it's, a, it's an account of a life. Then we have this poem that kind of juts in here. 
and uh, we get again this bear witness, O oh Lord, and then for these of my merits, may I and every life that's yet to come be born when each Buddha appears to serve them with my whole being. May I be rich, flush with vast wealth, gold, gems, and wish-fulfilling jewels. Like the merchant Jodhika Sethi, whose riches were beyond compare, may I be kind toward all creatures, giving them gifts with firm resolve, without any hesitation, just like great Prince Vasantara. May I be like Prince Damia, my heart always patient and pure, and may my mind glow with goodness, pleasing to both men and women. Should some commit capital crimes or be condemned to endless pain, may I free them from such ruling so that they may gain their lives. May I exchange my life for theirs, just like all Buddhas have resolved. May I serve as their guarantor for all creatures, their last refuge. Then we have the end part of his aspirations. Um, and this, this one is somewhat unique in the inscriptional corpus I'm familiar with in that he doesn't just aspire to become a Buddha in the future, but to be very specifically the 11th uh, Buddha to appear. In other words, in the Anagdalungs and other Pali texts, uh, there's a listing of the next 10 Buddhas to appear, but the ones after that are unnamed. So he's claiming his spot in line, as it were, <laughs> to be the 11th. Um, and uh, so that's what I hear. May I then be the next one to awaken with the wisdom and insight of the mission. Buddha, fit to lead living beings to nirvana, just like the long line of Buddhas and beyonds past. So when I first you know, read this, um, and the usual way this has been interpreted is that this part has been understood as prose because it kind of, this part doesn't scan as poetry and it, the way it's written on the stone, it just looks like prose. But uh, I also recognize that this was coming from a verse text that's still recited in Cambodia today. Um, and that verse text is, um, here's, a, here's a translation of it. Um, this is connected to an, a Pali text. Uh, this is a translation uh, uh, from, the, from the Khmer. Um, and it's also connected to a Pali text that appears only, that I've only place I found it is in the Colophon to the, um, a temple chronicle of a temple in Sri Lanka. The, and I'm forgetting the name of this specific temple, but the, I, I, I can look up the, the, the specific uh, name in a sec, but um, the content of that aspiration um, not the way it, it begins here, but the later content of it is um, some, at some stage borrowed into Cambodia, presumably from Sri Lankan sources. We don't know exactly when, um, though there could have been all kinds of other intermediaries in between, uh, but then shows up in this text. And as we move through this long series of aspirations, we see the same ones that we just saw. So after this opening, uh, verses of praise to the Buddha, we get the, that same content that uh, some like Brad Paramitu aspired to. May I in all future eons, every life that's yet to come, be born when each Buddha appears to serve in my whole being, might be rich, flushed with vast wealth, gold gems, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, uh, may I exchange my life for theirs, just like all Buddhas have resolved, may I serve as their guarantor for all creatures, their last refuge. Then it goes on with a whole bunch of other um, aspirations. Uh, so for instance, may I recall the three Vedas and all their spells to perfection with total ease and efficacy like Lord Shiva, best of the gods. May I be blessed with a brilliant mind, my answers to riddles roundly praised, the resolutions of doubts so marvelous they raise the hair of all around. May I awaken to the vastness of the Dharma while still young, memorizing the three baskets of the canon in seven years. May my voice be resonant, resounding with sonorous tones, charming the ears of all who hear, just like the voice of Lord Brahma. So when I chant the true Dharma, my voice astounds the gods on high, hailing them down from the heavens to rejoice in the Buddha's teachings. And for me, it's quite significant that this, this very song is, or very poem, is one that is recited with the melody in Cambodia that is sort of celebrated as the most complex or the most uh, musically um, compelling. Mm. Um, and so there's this way, if contemporary performance practice is anything to go by, um, that connects back to how this poem, which must have existed prior to uh, the inscription by some like uh, Parabitu in 1684, mm. who borrowed from it. Um, mm. But it was something that was on his lips, that was on his mind, mm. 
um, that felt like it was appropriate for his own account of his life and aspirations, um, but also was coming out of this, this broader, more generalized source. So I just wanted to offer that as a something to think with in, in the questions you, uh, you all have raised. I'm not sure if it makes it clearer or less clear. So, but you, your assumption, sorry. Yeah, um, please. Just, yeah. But, the, but the, your assumption based on what you just said is that when someone reproduces this, yeah. they are sort of signaling their um, own kind of personal af affirmation or commitment to the, se the sentiments of the text itself. The, I, there's two questions I have with that. Like, um, I mean, I think that's an assumption that we should hold out because I think it's a question, you know, it's an assumption we could question. But also what about in the case where, um, you know, these things are, um, you know, sponsored by certain people and therefore, you know, like, you know, they're essentially, the I is the, is the sponsor, not the person who's actually scribing it. Does that add a, another level of complication? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yes. The scribe might, might just have slotted in something that fit. Mm -hmm. I'm being, you know, but, you know, like. But the, you know, but the sponsor didn't even write it. Yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, yeah. the sponsor may not have really known much. Yeah. The sponsor for the inscription. Yeah. Yes. yes. King, uh, whatever is that, Paravide, whatever. Yeah. Yes, it's, po it's it, that, that's very possible. Yeah, yeah. We don't have a good sense of how exactly um, the relationship between scribes and the poets or authors who are writing these inscriptions, who are composing the words for them and the sponsors. So um, just make me look good and, um, you know, 30 <laughs> centimeters or something. Yeah. Because so I'm not paying for 30 we, I mean, we don't exactly know how, how this, this happened. Some of them are very clearly planned out mm -hmm. and they fit the space of the stone mm -hmm. uh, very well. Others, they they run out of space at the end or they leave this big gap. So there's, there's a, a really interesting range, but we don't have kind of contemporaneous evidence that would show sort of what's happening in, in those questions. I think for the, for something that regards, regarding this text is very interesting to me is that the content of the aspirations, once we get this deep into the text and the, the aspirations get more and more lofty until they end with, they end with Buddhahood. Mm -hmm. um, none of, those portions of the text are ever recited today in Cambodia. Interesting. Yeah. Only the basically the first four stanzas Something are recited. Everybody knows it. Yeah. I, well, in this, to me, what what's one? It's a change in time of ritual. This would take maybe um, two hours to recite the whole thing because it's recited with a very slow melody. So that's one dimension. But I think the other dimension is it doesn't fit with the way the religious aspirations that that Cambodians would articulate today. Mm. So okay. it somehow feels it's not, it's past its time. So mm. that's why it wouldn't be articulated because it was to be chanted, then it would, what is that? Is that really what I'm aspiring for? Because yeah. it's, it's, it's a very lofty kind of mm. aspiration. But sorry, I cut you off, Elizabeth, you were saying. Oh, no, no, I was just saying the difference between puja and prayer. Mm. I was gonna ask about that. And then prayer, there's always ego involved and puja is more you know, turning the clock, mm -hmm. doing the ritual. I, just something I wrote down, yeah. Goth, I think you had a question too, right? No, I was just wondering, um, so um, it, you mentioned about um, some sort of ritual change or the inspiration um, for those who recite the text. So they, probably indicate um, some sort of reformation, reform, um, and the focus on Arahatship rather than Buddhahood becoming the Buddhahood. So that's why the, the, possibility, the yes. possibility that why they cut. Um, Absolutely, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, in, and indeed there's a um, another text uh, here I can uh, uh, pull it up. When was this poem uh, written? Most likely early 17th century or late 16th century. As we know, it was already memorized and current in the um, uh, late 17th century. So for instance, today, sometimes this one is used in place. So instead of a, this is just a title I'm giving it. Usually the title is something like 
lobok potum, the poem on lotuses, or sometimes potum plantka, lotus flower, the offering of flowers, something like that. Um, but this, the this, the same melody is used, and it's following the same, and some of the lines are the same, but it's a this set of aspirations match uh, a contemporary doctrinal context. So instead of aspiring for Buddhahood and to achieve all of these very lofty goals, it simply says, here we're all bereaved, worn out, beat up, broken, whirled by worldly life, sundered from our spouses. We're bound to suffer in rounds of birth and death. No one can help us, ours alone the anguish. We offer these flowers to you, Lord, so that we might be from fault be freed and break the grip of age, flee the pit of pain, leave death in the dust, and one day delight in Nirvana's repose. May our prayers fly straight, may true by honesty, real bliss may it come for us all step by step. So again, this, this way of articulating it, I think to your point, what I made really captures a, a more contemporary approach to the, the same ideas. Such beautiful translations, man, I have to say. <laughs> Eric, Eric's has a... Oh, great. How, if all, did the arrival of technology of mass modern printing transform the transmission, preservation, and or use of Buddhist poetry as prayer in the colonial and post-colonial eras? Did it transform the aesthetic forms or techniques of Buddhist poetry as prayer in any way? Did it transform Buddhist poetry as prayer into generalized liturgical forms that were distinct from prior eras. Now it's that last question that I'm particularly interested in that I hadn't thought about before. Did it transform Buddhist poetry as prayer into generalized liturgical forms that are distinct from prior eras? That's, that's a fascinating question because these kinds of more, the autobiographical dimensions that show up in, in Buddhist liturgical poetry that was clearly designed to be recited, but also includes these statements about the author and about the very particular things they're writing. I don't see as much of that happening in the world of print. Yeah. Um, that is very common in, in manuscripts up to the you know, sort of in the case of Cambodia, um, just like much of mainland Southeast Asia, manuscript uses continued well into the era of print. But up through the middle of the 20th century, there are lots of examples of these kinds of poems that have a very personal element yeah. to them. And those, uh, we have, again, evidence for this from the 16th century up to the middle of the 20th century for that, but le that's less present today. Um, something that happened in the kinds of Buddhist reform movements was also a uh, a unification of liturgical practices. Mm -hmm. So this happened uh, with uh, some of the uh, reforms uh, really going back to the first reign in the, uh, the beginning of the Ratanakosin period at the end of the 18th century. Um, it happened in a new way under King Mangkut in the middle of the 19th century. Um, in Cambodia, those kind of reforms really took off uh, with ideas from some like Chuan Mat and Huat Bat um, during the a French colonial period. And again, that idea of liturgy as a really bound vehicle of set texts uh, that everyone needs to agree upon and use within certain Theravada settings is what gets imported in a very wholesale way to the Vietnamese context uh, with Ho Dong and, and his, his colleagues. And to me, that's so fascinating because it's something that just formed in Cambodia in the context of print. So I think that that yeah. question um, uh, is really speaks to the heart of what's what's what changes were happening through yeah. those uh, changes in technology. This of course definitely happened in Sri Lanka, right? Like this 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 sort of standardization and um, the attempt to kind of create a unified sort of liturgical kind of manual or Givinia type volumes. I mean, like basically around the turn of the 19th century, when you go and look at the pamphlet collection, say in the um, uh, Museum Library at Colombo, it's full of stuff like that. This is monks writing. This is like some kind of new standard prayer book for um, that you should all Buddhists should use at the Vihara and things. Yeah. Great, great. So I'm just, another thing I'm thinking is um, like, presumably you should see ritual and iconography, right? And I was just like, there's this amazing thing, you know, the statue of Jayavarman the seventh, 
oh, yes. for like how many years everybody thought he was meditating. Yes. And then they find the arms and realize that he's actually in some pay. Now, is that a prayer? Or is that? Well, that's what's being, yeah, prayer I think is, is problematic, <laughs> but it's certainly what is the he, texts are describing. You, you know, I mean, yeah. You know, if he was meditating, we'd know he was into his own. No, body. this is definitely not prayer, right? This is this is a namaskara kind it's of a yeah, namaskara. Yeah. It's puja. But it's you know what these texts are describing is what one yeah. should be doing while reciting or listening to them or making these aspirations. Those aspirations are made with hands in, yeah. in a certain form, position. Not, yeah. So, but for years everybody thought he was meditating because they, mm -hmm. they missed the arms. Yeah. So that completely changed. So you've got to be able to find it in iconography, is what I'm saying. If you've got, <laughs> if you've got <laughs> ritual, yeah. yeah. Or if you've got prayer. Yeah. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Yes, yeah, sorry. But just oh. blah, 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 blah. I mean, this question you've like really like put your finger on something, Trent. Mm. Yeah. It's just like very clear that it's yeah. a really generative question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> question. yeah. Thank you so much, Sharon. Yeah. Reach nirvana. I, I am aware that it's almost five and you do have a commitment yeah. at five. This is true. This is true. Um, <laughs> questions that those of you here in the room or those of you on Zoom that you've wanted to ask but didn't get a chance to? You can always, as, as I mentioned, you can always email them um, to me and we can raise them tomorrow. You can come and, and raise them tomorrow as well. It looks like Peter might have something. I know I'm just saying. Thanks for your talk. I've enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much for coming. Well, if there aren't further questions at this time, let's uh, adjourn here and we'll meet again tomorrow at the same time. Uh, thank you again so much for those of you um, coming in from far away. It's great to have your presence and your questions. So thank you. Thank you so much to each and every one of you. And thank you to those of you here in the room. It's, it's great to um, to share in this space with you and I'm glad we get to continue these conversations too. Yeah. That's